My name is Walid Shuibat. I was born as a Muslim who desired the destruction of God's people. In trying to disprove the God of the Bible, I actually found him. Now I have dedicated my life to revealing the truth about Islam through books, radio, television, and the internet. In this series, we will discuss biblical end times prophecy and what the God of the Bible has to say about the very days we are living in now. We meet at a time of great tension between the United States and Muslims around the world. The relationship between Islam and the West includes centuries of coexistence and cooperation, but also conflict and religious wars. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning. The United States will never be at war with Islam. Name me one that is not Muslim. In every single context where Christ is on earth fighting, he's fighting a Muslim country. Does the Bible predict such a cataclysmic event with so many Muslim nations? The answer is absolutely yes. Surely we have considered much evidence for God's war on Islamic terror and used literal references to prove it. Now we can apply that evidence that we have discussed to the allegorical passages in scripture in order to form a clear and complete image from this vast prophetic puzzle. But before we do that, we need the key that unlocks the meaning behind the allegorical words and helps us understand biblical symbolism. The Bible is the finest, richest literature imaginable. It has been shaped and enlivened by the same oral and written traditions that humankind has used since Adam and Eve. It is filled with dazzling figurative language, poetry, prophecy, and historical allusions. Trained Bible scholars must possess an array of tools, including knowledge of the metaphor, simile, allegory, personification, and symbolism, as well as a thorough knowledge of the times in which the Bible's authors have lived. Otherwise, attempts at interpreting the scriptures can be likened to those of the lazy student who simply says, the poem means whatever I want it to mean. No, the poem means what its author intended it to mean. The purpose of studying the Bible is to properly understand the meaning of any passage as the author intended it to be understood. The Bible is God's word, and he means for us to understand what he says, not what we would like him to say. We do not wish to come away from the Bible with our own ideas about the future, but rather we hope to learn what God is telling us, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. The Bible is constant and does not change meaning with every altering wind. For the last 500 years, the prevailing wind within the Protestant Church has suggested that the Antichrist will come out of the Roman Catholic Church or that we are somehow moving toward a one-world government. While there are indeed satanic forces that would like to unite the world for their own purpose, a close examination of the scriptures tells us that Satan will not succeed. This theory of Antichrist controlling the whole world is completely wrong. God intervened in the Tower of Babel during Satan's first attempt for control of the world. This story will repeat itself when Christ intervenes and comes down to stop the Antichrist from establishing a one-world government, an Islamic caliphate, that is. He intervened in the Tower of Babel, 
and he will intervene in Armageddon. We must allow the Bible to speak its own language, so let us look at the main symbols and decipher the keys to unlock the puzzle. Many of the symbols used during biblical times are still commonly understood in many cultures today, but they are not easy for many Westerners. Thus, we need a little background. The Bible often uses mountains as a symbol representing a kingdom or an empire. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. In other words, God's kingdom will be over all other kingdoms. This is pretty simple. In the East, this language is common, but Western misconceptions and lack of understanding Eastern usage have caused much confusion. In the West, many are waiting for the Catholic Church to arise to power. Rome, after all, is the city of seven hills. But listen to Ahmed al-Nijad of Iran in one of his I Have a Dream speeches. Do not doubt, Allah will prevail and Islam will conquer mountain tops of the entire world. The mountain tops Ahmed al-Nijad is speaking of are the great kingdoms and governments of the Western Great Britain and America. This is the proper Eastern allegoric usage for the word mountain. Many passages in the Bible confirms the usage of this word, mountains as kingdoms. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Ye, my flock was scattered among all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. And in Daniel 2, then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. From the stone that is the Messiah will come the great mountain, which is the kingdom of Christ. The mountain will fill the whole earth, in other words, the kingdom of God will rule over all the earth. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. If one reads these passages, Replacing the word mountain with kingdom and waters or seas with peoples, tribes, and different ethnic backgrounds, then it is easy to understand the picture. In the verse we just quoted, the Bible even gives the explanation. Mountains falling in verse 2 are kingdoms falling. Christ spoke of having the faith of a mustard seed that we can move mountains. Are these literal mountains? Of course not. These are governments and kingdoms. Exactly what the disciples and the first believers did. They eventually changed the Middle East, which was all converted to the faith. In addition to mountains symbolizing nations, Revelation 17.5 tells us that waters and rivers represent people. And he says unto me, The waters which thou saw, where the whore sits, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The primary source for understanding the meaning of a word or symbol is always the text itself. Sometimes a passage may not be properly understood unless one understands what has been made clear in another text elsewhere in the Bible. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion 
which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from river unto the ends of the earth. These two passages actually are saying the same thing. While Daniel specifically says that Christ will rule over people, nations, and languages, the psalm refers symbolically to waters, seas, and rivers. But they are both, in fact, declaring the same message. As we move on, we will see many other common biblical symbols used. Once you begin to understand these symbols, the passages actually become fairly clear, and their message is always consistent. I will make waste mountains and hills, and dry up all their herbs, and I will make the rivers islands, and I will dry up the pools. When you pass through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. The Bible also uses the symbol of heads to represent kingdoms. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. We already know that a mountain is a kingdom, a head also is a kingdom. A kingdom is obviously ruled by a king. There are also seven kings. One cannot have a kingdom without a king. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. One of the kingdoms is destroyed and comes back to life. One cannot isolate the kingdom from the king. The death of the head is the ending of the kingdom. A common assumption is that the beast of Revelation is a man. However, it is clear from Scripture that a single entity does not necessarily represent a single being. For instance, in Revelation 19.7, we read, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Just as the wife, bride, of Revelation 19.20 represents many people from different nations, tribes, and different tongues, the beast of Revelation in 19.7 represents a nation or an empire, a collective group of many people. The metaphorical use of the beast and the bride is consistent with use of figures of speech throughout Scripture. Every instance of the word beast in Daniel chapter 7, 11, 19, and 23 is a reference to an empire with rulers or kings represented by horns. These rulers are represented also with the word beast when they come out of the earth. These great beasts, in this case empires, are four in number, are four kings that are horns, who will arise from the earth. A beast always represents a group of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue that follows a false religion and its leader, that is the horn. So when the beast is taken and the false prophet with him, we understand that the empire and its leader, the horn, are removed. We know from Scripture that Satan seeks to be like God, to rule the earth, to have his own kingdom. With this in mind, we see that an Islamic revival is quite plausible as Satan attempts to woo followers. Jesus, our Messiah, desires his bride, his saints, that is, for love, forgiveness and reconciliation, and Satan desires his kingdom for destruction, parallels at opposite ends of the moral spectrum. Just as the bride awaits the coming of the bridegroom, Islam is waiting for the leader that they call the Mahdi. The Mahdi, of course, will lead them in the footsteps of his predecessor Muhammad, 
Thus we see the beast of Revelation 13.3 waiting and determined to follow the previous beast whose deadly wound was healed. Another thing we need to learn is that the Bible uses the term name as a declaration of faith or creed. Let me explain. When Psalm 83 verse 16, for example, states that they may seek your name, O Lord, the Bible is not giving us the literal name of God, but the definition, him being the Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a name which means God with us. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. No one accepts the names of the true God except the ones who believe in his attributes, that Messiah is Almighty God and the God with us. We need to think more deeply when we study scripture. Names in the East always regard the creed or the attributes, the descriptions and the titles of the person they signify. In the same way is the name of the beast a blasphemous declaration that puts in God's place someone else other than his son. This is crucial for us to understand, for the harlot of Revelation has names, that is, creeds of blasphemy on her forehead, and so do the followers of the Antichrist. The followers of Antichrist will then have a creed of blasphemy on their hands and foreheads, which is exactly what we see many Muslims do in our day. The Bible talks about the dragon being none other than Satan himself. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. In the book of Revelation, the Apostle John gives us a very vivid description of an end times beast. There I saw a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads are seven empires that have existed throughout history, yet they re-arise all at once in the end. As usual, whenever a biblical prophecy contains symbolism, the Bible clarifies and explains the passage for us. This calls for a mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. But when he does, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. There are several reasons why Revelation 17 cannot be referring to Rome or Europe, but rather to the Islamic Empire. The seven heads are not Rome or the Vatican. They are seven heads and are called seven mountains and seven kings. Although this passage has been widely interpreted as a reference to Rome, the city on seven hills, the actual context does not allow for such an interpretation. How could Rome be situated on seven hills that are also seven kings, each with a name of blasphemy on it? That simply doesn't make any sense. An attempt to find, in this passage, a reference to Rome is founded on irresponsible hermeneutics. This passage gives us an insight into the fact that before Jesus returns, there will actually have been a total of eight beast empires, the 
eighth empire will be ruled by the Antichrist, the beast who once was and now is not, is an eighth king. How can this passage help us gain insight into the identification of the final Antichrist empire? First, we see that the time that it was written, five of the empires had already fallen. This is seen in the phrase, five have fallen. These empires are, number one, the Egyptian empire, number two, the Assyrian empire, number three, the Babylonian empire, number four, the Persian empire, number five, the Greek empire. After these five, the angel tells John that one mountain, that is an empire, which is is at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. This was the Roman Empire. This will be the sixth empire. It ruled in the Middle East, Northern Africa, and much of Europe. So number six, the Roman Empire. The purpose of this prophecy is to give the composite of the last empire and the sequence of kingdoms up until the seventh. The purpose of this prophecy is to give the composite of the last empire and the sequence of kingdoms up until the seventh. In order to pinpoint exactly this empire and its revival as the eighth under the Antichrist, this is basically the summary of a, the prophetic riddle. So this seventh empire is the one we need to identify. According to the verse, the Eighth Empire will be a resurrection or a revived version of the Seventh Empire. The beast who once was and is not is an Eighth King. Let me just paraphrase this portion for clarity. The Seventh Beast, that is the Empire, that will come into existence and then cease to exist, will come back as the eighth and final empire. During John's day, the seventh empire did not yet exist. John was in the Roman Empire. This would dismiss the empire that John was under. The seventh empire must sprout from the Egyptian, Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, and the Grecian empires yet encompasses all. The seventh will include them all. So will the eighth, which is the revival, that is, of the seventh. So if we are now waiting for the final eighth empire, then what was the seventh? What empire followed the Roman Empire? The most common belief held amongst universally by Bible teachers is that the Antichrist Empire will be a revived Roman Empire. There are some glaring problems with this theory. First, Rome was the sixth empire and not the seventh. If Rome was the sixth and it comes again as the seventh, then what do we do with the eighth? Do we have three revivals of Roman empires? Is Rome the sixth, seventh, and also the eighth empires? Neither scripture, nor history, nor common sense supports this notion. Yet many prophecy teachers ignore this glaring problem. Secondly, every one of the previous six empires ruled the Middle East, including Jerusalem. This is very important. We must always remember that the Bible is thoroughly Jerusalem-centric. It is not America-centric, nor is it Eurocentric. In the biblical view of things, Jerusalem is the center of the earth. This is, in fact, the overreaching context of Scripture. This point cannot be underscored enough. Any theory that revolves around the revival of a Roman Empire based in Europe for instance, on a European common market 
is a foreign concept to the Bible. The third crucial point is that if we look at the first six empires, by and large, each succeeding empire either destroyed or absorbed by the empire that preceded it. There is a very natural succession. If we look at each empire, we see that they all fulfill these two characteristics. They ruled over Jerusalem and they defeated or absorbed their predecessor. The Egyptian empire ruled all of Egypt and Israel as well. The Assyrian Empire defeated the Egyptian Empire and likewise ruled over a vast portion of the Middle East, including Israel. After this, the Babylonian Empire defeated the Assyrian Empire and became even a larger than its predecessor, again ruling over Israel. Such is the pattern with each successive empire. The Medo-Persian Empire succeeded the Babylonian Empire only to be succeeded by the Grecian Empire. The Grecian Empire was in turn succeeded by the Roman Empire, which leads us to the Seventh Empire. So who overcame the Roman Empire? It was none other than the Muslim Empire of the Ottoman Turks.